Good morning. Good to see everyone here in person this morning and all of you who are gathered on Zoom as well. Welcome to Cairn Christian Church. We are an open and affirming congregation, a green chalice congregation, and we are seeking to become an anti-racism congregation too. And we welcome all people into our midst. So now let us come together, whatever you bring into this space today. Maybe it's a hardened spirit or a heart that is overflowing with gratitude. Perhaps it's a worried mind or a body that is alert and thriving. Let it be present. Present to God, who is mystery beyond our knowing and yet present in our loving present to these, our siblings and cousins in this journey of faith, and present to our own longings and needs, and present to the needs of the world. Let us flow through this worship as God's presence flows through us. As we sing our opening hymn, we will light our candles both here and at home. So let us stand in body or in spirit as we sing together for each day of life. We thank you. Let us stand together. I invite you now all into prayer with me. God of compassion, we are in need of your comfort, your joy, and the never ending ebb and flow of our lives. We ask for your presence. Over the past few years, our lives have been thrown into uncertainty and fear. And our children have been experiencing these right along with us. Today, we turn our attention to their experiences and our loss of being able to physically walk alongside them to give them comfort. Help us to now embody your compassion as we continue to support our children and youth everywhere as we can. 
We ask again for your presence to be known to them and for your comfort. Today, we also lift up all those who are grieving, all those who are suffer suffering and are in pain. We lift up those who are celebrating and those who endure. We lift up especially places steeped in violence and loss, Haiti, Lebanon, Beirut, Afghanistan, Myanmar. And we remember the children there too, whose experiences we cannot comprehend. We lift up the ebb and flow of our lives to you, gracious God. Amen. Holiness, covering over the water of the deep, tide of spirit flowing through creation, surge of breath as we rise and fall through our days and years. Make our spirits fluid and our breath easy as we move through the ebb and flow of this earthly life, through uncertainty and faith, messiness and grace, hardship and joy, this day and tomorrow. Amen. A litany of ebb and flow. The wisdom of our faith has repeatedly told us for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Everything will ebb and flow. Birth, death. Planting, harvesting. Rupturing, repairing. Simplifying, intensifying. Wounding healing, weeping and laughing, mourning and dancing, drawing close and giving space, loving and the apathy of loving gone still, peaceful compassion and hateful violence. Adding our voice, keeping our silence. Moving quickly and holding still. Everything has a time and a season. The wisdom of our faith still tells us. God stands outside of our time. God blesses our time as well. The past and the future, the present, here and now. Eat, drink, have pleasure, and work hard as you can. God will endure. Meet the hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. God will endure. Question what to believe and battle faulty powers. God will endure. Neither death nor life neither things present nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from God's love. We will fall down, we will stand up. We will sing with weeping and we will sing with resilience. We will dance our defiance, we will dance our convictions. We will live and we will die. We will experience whatever is in between. And in all these things, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which flows to us and lives with us.
Our scripture reading today is from Exodus 1 and 2. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The total number of people born to Jacob was 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and that whole generation. But the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them and they will increase or they will increase in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the banks of the river. I told part of this story to the children downstairs. And it's a story that floors me every time I hear it. It moves from a sweeping national and political story to a single intimate story of one child. It takes place in the book of Exodus, the second book of our Bible. The nomadic people of Israel have been formed around and led by Abraham and Sarah, the matriarch and patriarch, and by their son Isaac, and then Isaac and Rebekah's son Jacob, who also was known as Israel. Jacob's sons and their descendants became the 12 tribes of Israel. One of Jacob's sons was Joseph, second to the youngest and yet favored by his father, Jacob. Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, became powerful in Egypt and rescued his family and all of the people of Israel from famine, bringing them to Egypt where they settled and became great in number, so great, in fact, that the new king became fearful of their power and enslaved them. Forced labor, bitter lives, hard service, but still the Israelites multiplied. So a ruthless scheme was initiated by the king to force the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the male babies as they were being delivered. In an act of defiance and bravery, the midwives let the boys live. Their names were Shifra and Pua, names we should not forget. So he became even more ruthless commanding all of his people to take every newborn boy and throw them into the Nile. And then the focus of the story shifts. A man and a woman from the tribe of Levi give birth to a son. 
It is a story that has become a favorite in children's curriculums. Something about the sweet baby Jesus, baby Moses, in a basket among the reeds, with his sister watching over him and being rescued by a princess. It seems a fitting story, worthy of Disney. But that's not the story at all. It is a story that floors me every time I hear it because the mother in me can only see Moses' mother. I can only see that she is living as a slave in a land where her people once had been free, living in poverty where her people had once had plenty. And into this time and place, she gives birth to a son living now in terror for her newborn child, knowing there is nowhere that is safe, living now with this child whose life is in constant danger, hiding him for three long months, a situation made impossible as he grows. He will be found. So she makes the impossible decision. She lets him go. She places him in a basket among the reeds in the river. I can't imagine this gut-wrenching decision. I can't imagine saying goodbye. This story floors me every time I hear it. The whims and fears of political intrigue and power played out in the heart and mind of one mother. Not unlike the story of Mary and Joseph fleeing to Egypt to escape the terror of Herod the Great after the massacre of the innocent. Now we know the rest of the story we know Moses and Jesus go on to live and to find their way and to do the things they feel called by God to do. Stand up to Pharaoh, leveraging the power gained by being raised by Pharaoh's daughter and by his own battles within himself. Stand up to Herod Antipas, and to those colluding with him by standing with the people in their oppression and by facing his own temptations and fears. We know the rest of the story, but Mary and Joseph didn't have this knowledge. Moses's mother didn't have this knowledge. They were nobodies in a world that threatened their very existence and the existence of their children. And they did the best that they could. For Mary and Joseph, it meant leaving their home behind, political refugees in a strange land. For Moses' mother, it meant saying goodbye to her son, leaving him to a fate she could not imagine. Then by the cleverness of her daughter, possibly Miriam, she is able to nurse him until he has been weaned but then has to release him once more back into Pharaoh's household. We know the rest of the story that they did not. We know the story of resurrection and the story of crossing the Red Sea and the story of reaching the promised land. We know the stories of grace and hope and freedom and plenty, each of which arises out of these stories of loss and despair and oppression and need. Our scripture understands that the political and the personal are intimately tied together. What happens in our world plays out with specificity in countless lives, and children are too often the ones who suffer. I think we understand here at Cairn what this means and what this looks like. I think we try to live within this tension. 
That on the one hand, the world is a terrifying, brutal, greedy, violent place. That the powerful, the pharaohs and the Herods are terrified of losing their power. That we find ourselves sometimes in the position of the powerful, fearful and protective of ourselves, and sometimes in the position of the powerless, living our lives within the confines of someone else's vision of reality. That we are caught in the grand designs, not of our own choosing and not of our power to significantly change. Climate change or the suffering on our Southern border or consumerism or technology invading every part of our lives or gun violence or economic injustice or racism or sexism, they are all too big for us. And yet we cannot turn our backs. We cannot give in. We cannot bury our heads in the sand. The big picture all around us matters to God. The suffering of people matters to God. Unchecked power and greed matters to God. And we understand here at Cairn that we are God's voices of a different reality. That while the world may be terrifying and brutal and greedy and violent, our stories to the contrary matter. That while the pharaohs and Herods grab the headlines, our stories have lasting significance. Pharaoh and Herod are footnotes in scripture. The stories of Moses and Jesus are epic tales that stir our hearts and minds towards freedom and justice, transformation and grace, courage and hope. And so part of what we do here at Cairn as the media swirls around us, as the political shifts and swings whirl and spin, as pharaohs and Herods reigns, as we always have the suffering ones in our midst, as we cannot fix it all, as even Moses and Jesus did not fix it all, we do what Moses's mother did. We make a basket of papyrus and we plaster it with bitumen and pitch and we place it among the reeds in the banks of a river. We make a space to keep the good safe to keep the stories of freedom alive, to cradle that which is beautiful and grace-filled, to keep hope alive, to make sacrifices for the safety of others, spaces where we do not collude with evil, spaces where we find the courage to do what is right, spaces where we do not know the outcome, but we step into the situation we have been given. Spaces where grief is released as love, fear is released as hope, and we let God do the rest. And our hope and grace and courage and love and beauty and sacrifice and fear bob around in the ebb and flow of the waters, brushing up against the tall reeds and the political intrigue. And there is absolutely no guarantee. You will have to go to a different church if you want guarantees. If you want guarantees of results, here at Cairn, the result is the papyrus basket plastered in bitumen, placed in the ebb and flow. The result is facing impossible grief 
It is choosing life in the face of death, choosing hope instead of despair, choosing love instead of hate. That's the result. Through this season, we have been tracing the contours of our own grief. <coughs> the loss of this sacred space for 73 Sundays. The loss of singing together. The loss of breathing easy. The loss of hugs and handshakes and kisses on cheeks. The loss of sharing bread and wine hand to hand, the loss of the buzz and the noise and the joy of all of us together at once. Today, we remember that we lost seeing our kids grow up. We saw five of those kids, I believe you saw it while I was downstairs in today's video. Owen. Martin, Noah, Hannah, Jacob. Each of them so very different, so grown up compared to 18 months ago. We missed getting to see Jin Charles in those beautiful tiny early days following his birth. We missed watching Jacob move from babe in arms cradled against Carrie in his carrier to walking, talking dinosaur expert. We miss seeing Lily and Jay and Tobias and Hannah and Rowan and Jocelyn move from toddlers to kindergartners. We miss watching Emma May and Jasmine and Story, Annabelle and Noah and Martin jump two grades and become even more articulate than they were before. We miss seeing all of these kids running around the church, playing and engaging with each other and dancing on the lap. We missed the unbelievable growth spurts in Maya and Ezra, and Andrew, and Tim, and Carmen, and Owen, and Carter Etherton. They are not little kids anymore. And we missed that transition. And Grace became a high schooler, and Nick became a junior, and Carter became a senior, and Craig found a whole new path and we missed it. And Sam and Cameron graduated and we missed it. Adults now, and we missed it. Some of our kids we've barely seen over the past 18 months because this pandemic has been hard on them and because family life has been hard and because Zoom didn't work for them and we miss them. And I don't know what else to do with all of this, but to put our gr grief about that into a papyrus basket plastered in bitumen and pitch and place it in the ebb and flow and watch it brush up against the tall reeds and release it. And as I sit by the bank of the river to recall our stories of hope, that as a community in these past 18 months, we never lost sight of ministering to these kids, hard as it was. We never lost sight of being an intergenerational community. We welcomed them to the Zoom screen every Sunday, both in the greeting time and in the children's moment. We came up with a Zoom Sunday School program. We hosted special youth events and games online. We celebrated birthdays, graduations, and the new school year. We had Halloween parties and Easter egg hunts in the fresh open air. We interacted with our kids during breakout rooms, looking at their artwork, hearing their stories. In some ways, perhaps we even got more time 
to interact with some of our kids than ever before. Grace in the midst of grief. When I look back on these 18 months, our journey through a global pandemic and in a world of national and political struggles, and our journey as a small community committed to raising these children together. I am grateful for our papyrus basket that we've shaped together. I am grateful for the ways we have kept courage and hope. And I am grateful for our small and beautiful story. I am grateful that we have all been Moses's mother, holding space for a hopeful future. Amen. I invite us all now to join together in singing our hymn of response, God of Our Life. come now to this table to bring our gifts and to receive the sacrament of communion. This teb table represents the ebb and flow of life, scarcity and abundance, brokenness and healing, sin and forgiveness, the empires of oppression and the kingdom of love, being lost and being found the darkness of the tomb, and the light of a new day. So bring to this table your grief and your languishing, bring your joy and your thriving, bring your own personal ebb and flow and step into the ebb and flow of our faith to wash away your burdens and be surprised by grace. During communion, you are invited to bring that slip of blue paper and release it into the ebb and flow. And take a moment to do this. You can place it anywhere on the table, in the bowl with the water, the bowl with sand or around the can, or at home in the special place that you have set aside for these slips of paper. Let us now prepare our hearts and our spirits as we sing together our communion hymn, this is a day of new beginnings. Oh, 
And so Jesus gathered with friends, disciples at a table to share a meal, remembering that story of freedom, the passing over of death that began when that basket was placed in the waters and Moses lived. At that feast, Jesus took some of their common bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body. And in the same way, after the supper, he took one of their common cups and then said, this is a new covenant of love. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we share this bread and this cup, remembering God's promises to us. Remembering that Jesus lived his life for others and joining our longings for freedom with those throughout the ages. Let us give thanks. Let us pray. Loving God, some things change over time. We grow older, our children sprout up in front of our eyes or when we're not even looking. But God, some things stay the same. Your love, your compassion, your presence, and this table. Thank you for this table that's a constant and a reminder of your constant love that never changes. Let us take bread and cup together as a constant reminder. Amen. Amen. So let us come to this table. All people are welcome.
As I lift these baskets of our offerings and of our estimate of givings, our stewardship for this coming year, I invite those of you at home, if you have your estimate, to hold it in your hands at this time as we bless. Let us pray. Oh God, we come with gratitude. Gratitude for this day and these offerings but gratitude also for our history, for our memories, for our life together, for our children, for this time where we have been apart and found ways to be together, for this time when ministry has been difficult and yet we have continued in acts of service and justice and love. So gracious God also bless the promises made this day for our future, the commitments to continuing the work of justice and compassion in this place. May all of these be multiplied for goodness and for love. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear now the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's grace is revealed to heal our brokenness, to forgive our sins, and to set us free from all that would oppress us. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Creator God, Creating Still. Let us sing together. Now let us all go from this time and this place blessed by God, blessed by this community of life, and blessed to be a blessing in God's world. And may the peace of God be with each of you. Amen. Amen.